Hello, I'm Bill Gates, Chairman of Microsoft. In this video, you're going to see the future. Who is Bill Gates? A software developer? A businessman? A philanthropist? A global health expert? This question, once merely academic, is becoming a very real question for those who are beginning to realize that Gates' unimaginable wealth has been used to gain control over every corner of the fields of public health, medical research, and vaccine development. And now that we are presented with the very problem that Gates has been talking about for years, we will soon find that this software developer with no medical training is going to leverage that wealth into control over the fates of billions of people. Because until we get almost everybody vaccinated uh, globally, we still won't be fully back to normal. Bill Gates is no public health expert. He is not a doctor, an epidemiologist, or an infectious disease researcher. Yet somehow, he has become a central figure in the lives of billions of people, presuming to dictate the medical actions that will be required for the world to go back to normal. The transformation of Bill Gates from computer kingpin to global health czar is as remarkable as it is instructive, and it tells us a great deal about where we are heading as the world plunges into a crisis, the likes of which we have not seen before. This is the story of how Bill Gates monopolized global health. You're tuned into The Corbett Report. Until his reinvention as a philanthropist in the past decade, this is what many people thought of when they thought of Bill Gates. In the case of the United States versus Microsoft, the U.S. Justice Department contended that the software giant had breached antitrust laws by competing unfairly against Netscape communications in the Internet browser market, effectively creating a monopoly. Bill's first concern was that the prosecution could potentially block the release of his company's latest operating system, Windows 98. Okay, you ask me about when I wrote this email, or what are you asking me about? I'm, I'm asking you about January of 1996. That month? Yes, yeah, sir. And what about it? What non-Microsoft browsers were you concerned about in January of 1996? I don't know what you mean, concerned. Um, what is it about the word concerned that you don't understand? I'm not sure what you mean by it. We're going to be working together on Microsoft Office, on Internet Explorer, on Java, and I think that uh, it's going to lead to a, a very healthy relationship. So it's a package announcement today. We're very, very happy about it. We're very, very excited about it. And uh, I happen to have a special guest with me today uh, via satellite downlink. And uh, if we could uh, get him up on the stage right now. Police and security guards in Belgium were caught flat-footed today by a cowardly sneak attack on one of the world's wealthiest men. The target was Microsoft Chairman Bill Gates arriving for a meeting with community leaders. Watch what happens when a team of hitmen meet him first with a pie in the face. <laughs> Gates was momentarily and understandably shaken, but he was not injured. The hit squad piled on with two more pies before one of them was wrestled to the ground and arrested the others for at least the moment he got away. Gates went inside, wiped his face clean, and made no comment. He then went ahead with his scheduled meeting. No word on the motive for this attack. But once reviled for the massive wealth and the monopolistic power that his virus-laden software afforded him, Gates is now hailed as a visionary who is leveraging that wealth and power for the greater good of humanity. In the 22nd century, a book will be written about the entrepreneur of the 21st century. I'm sure that the person 
who will foremost come to the mind of those historians is certainly Bill Gates. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that Bill Gates is singularly, I would argue, the most consequential individual of our generation. Uh, I, I mean that. Our next guest is one of the richest and most generous men in the world. Please welcome Bill Gates. At a time when everyone is looking to understand the scope of the pandemic and how to minimize the threat, one of the best informed voices is that of businessman and philanthropist Bill Gates. The process by which this reinvention of Gates' public image took place is not mysterious. It's the same process by which every billionaire has revived their public image since John D. Rockefeller hired Ivy Ledbetter Lee to transform him from the head of the Standard Oil Hydra into the kind old man handing out dimes to strangers. Don't you give a dime, Mr. Rockefeller? Oh, please. Go ahead. Give it a dime. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I consider and I myself... Thank you for the ride. I consider myself more than amply paid. Bless you. Bless you. Yes. Bless you. More to the point... John D. Rockefeller knew that to gain the adoration of the public, he had to appear to give them what they want. Money. He devoted hundreds of millions of dollars of his vast oil monopoly fortune to establishing institutions that, he claimed, were for the public good. The General Education Board. The Rockefeller Institute of Medical Research. The Rockefeller Foundation. Similarly, Bill Gates has spent much of the past two decades transforming himself from software magnate into a benefactor of humanity through his own Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In fact, Gates has surpassed Rockefeller's legacy with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation long having eclipsed the Rockefeller Foundation as the largest private foundation in the world, with $46.8 billion of assets on its books that it wields in its stated program areas of global health and development, global growth, and global policy advocacy. And... Like Rockefeller, Gates' transformation has been helped along by a well-funded public relations campaign. Gone are the theatrical tricks of the PR pioneers. The ubiquitous ice cream cones of Gates' mentor Warren Buffett are the last remaining holdout of the old Rockefeller handing out dimes gimmick. No, Gates has guided his public image into that of a modern-day saint through an even simpler tactic. Buying good publicity. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation spends tens of millions of dollars per year on media partnerships, sponsoring coverage of its program areas across the board. Gates funds The Guardian's global development website. Gates funds NPR's global health coverage. Gates funds the Our World in Data website that is tracking the latest statistics and research on the coronavirus pandemic. Gates funds BBC coverage of global health and development issues, both through its BBC Media Action Organization and the BBC itself. Gates funds world health coverage on ABC News. When the NewsHour with Jim Lehrer was given a $3.5 million Gates Foundation grant to set up a special unit to report on global health issues, NewsHour communications chief Rob Flynn was asked about the potential conflict of interest that such a unit would have in reporting on issues that the Gates Foundation is itself involved in. In some regards, I guess you might say that there are not a heck of a lot of things you could touch in global health these days that would not have some kind of Gates tentacle. Flynn responded. Indeed, it would be almost impossible to find any area of global health that has been left untouched by the tentacles of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It was Gates who sponsored the meeting that led to the creation of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, a global public-private partnership bringing together state sponsors and big pharmaceutical companies whose specific goals include the creation of healthy markets for vaccines and other immunization products. As a founding partner of the alliance, the Gates Foundation provided $750 million in seed funding and has gone on to make over $4.1 billion in commitments to the group. Gates provided the seed money that created the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, a public-private partnership that acts as a finance vehicle for governmental AIDS, TB, and malaria programs. When a public-private partnership of governments, world health bodies, and 13 leading pharmaceutical companies came together in 2012 to accelerate progress toward eliminating or controlling 10 neglected tropical diseases, there was the Gates Foundation, with $363 million of support. When the Global Financing Facility for Women, Children, and Adolescents was launched in 2015 to leverage billions of dollars in public and private financing for global health and development programs, 
There was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as a founding partner with a $275 million contribution. When the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations was launched at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2017 to develop vaccines against emerging infectious diseases, there was the Gates Foundation with an initial injection of $100 million. The examples go on and on. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's fingerprints can be seen on every major global health initiative of the past two decades. And beyond the flashy multi-billion dollar global partnerships, the foundation is behind hundreds of smaller country and region-specific grants, $10 million to combat a locust infestation in East Africa, or $300 million to support agricultural research in Africa and Asia, that add up to billions of dollars in commitments. It comes as no surprise, then, that far beyond the $250 million that the Gates Foundation has pledged to the fight against coronavirus, every aspect of the current coronavirus pandemic involves organizations, groups, and individuals with direct ties to Gates funding. From the start, the World Health Organization has directed the global response to the current pandemic. From its initial monitoring of the outbreak in Wuhan, and its declaration in January that there was no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission, to its live media briefings and its technical guidance on country-level planning and other matters, the WHO has been the body setting the guidelines and recommendations shaping the global response to this outbreak. But even the World Health Organization itself is largely reliant on funds from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The WHO's most recent donor report shows that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the organization's second largest donor behind the United States government. The Gates Foundation single-handedly contributes more to the world health body than Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Russia, and the UK combined. What's more, current World Health Organization Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus is in fact, like Bill Gates himself, not a medical doctor at all, but the controversial ex-Minister of Health of Ethiopia, who was accused of covering up three cholera outbreaks in the country during his tenure. Before joining the WHO, he served as chair of the Gates-founded Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, and sat on the board of the Gates-founded Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and the Gates-funded Stop TB Partnership. The current round of lockdowns and restrictive stay-home orders in Western countries were enacted on the back of alarming models predicting millions of deaths in the United States and hundreds of thousands in the UK. Imperial College in London released a COVID-19 report, and that's where most of our U.S. leaders are getting the information they're basing their decision-making on. The report runs us through a few different ways this could turn out, depending on what our responses are. If we don't do anything to control this virus, over 80% of people in the U.S. would be infected over the course of the epidemic, with 2.2 million deaths from COVID-19. That 2.2 million deaths also doesn't account for the potential negative effects of health systems being overwhelmed. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must Stay at home. Enough is enough. Go home and stay home. A statewide order for people to stay at home. The work of two research groups was crucial in shaping the decisions of the UK and US governments to implement wide-ranging lockdowns and, in turn, governments around the world. The first group, the Imperial College COVID-19 Research Team, issued a report on March 16th that predicted up to 500,000 deaths in the UK and 2.2 million deaths in the US unless strict government measures were put in place. The second group, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation in Bill Gates' home state of Washington, helped provide data that corroborated the White House's initial estimates of the virus effects, estimates that have been repeatedly downgraded as the situation has progressed. Unsurprisingly, the Gates Foundation has injected substantial sums of money into both groups. This year alone, the Gates Foundation has already given $79 million to Imperial College. And in 2017, the Foundation announced a $279 million investment into the IHME to expand its work collecting health data and creating models. Anthony Fauci, meanwhile, has become the face of the U.S. government's coronavirus response echoing Bill Gates' assertion that the country will not get back to normal until a good vaccine can be found to ensure the public's safety. If you want to get to pre-corona virus, you know, that might not ever happen in the sense of the, the fact that the threat is there. But I believe 
with the therapies that will be coming online and with the fact that I feel confident that over a period of time we will get a good vaccine, that we will never have to get back to where we are right back now. Beyond just their frequent collaborations and cooperation in the past, Fauci has direct ties to Gates' projects and funding. In 2010, he was appointed to the leadership council of the Gates-founded Decade of Vaccines project to implement a global vaccine action plan, a project to which Gates committed $10 billion of funding. And in October of last year, just as the current pandemic was beginning, the Gates Foundation announced a $100 million contribution to the National Institute of Health to help among other programs, Fauci's National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases research into HIV. Also in October of last year, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation partnered with the World Economic Forum and the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security to stage Event 201, a tabletop exercise gauging the economic and societal impact of a globally spreading coronavirus pandemic. It began in healthy-looking pigs, months, perhaps years ago. A new coronavirus. The mission of the Pandemic Emergency Board is to provide recommendations to deal with the major global challenges arising in response to an unfolding pandemic. The board is comprised of highly experienced leaders from business, public health, and civil society. We're at the start of what's looking like it will be a severe pandemic. And there are problems emerging that can only be solved by global business and governments working together. Governments need to be willing to do things that are out of their historical perspective. Or, For the most part, it's, it's really a, a war footing that we need to be on. Given the incredible reach that the tentacles of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have into every corner of the global health markets, it should not be surprising that the Foundation has been intimately involved with every stage of the current pandemic crisis either. In effect, Gates has merely used the wealth from his domination of the software market to leverage himself into a similar position in the world of global health. The whole process has been cloaked in the mantle of selfless philanthropy, but the foundation is not structured as a charitable endeavor. Instead, it maintains a dual structure. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation distributes money to grantees, but a separate entity, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Trust, manages the endowment assets. These two entities often have overlapping interests, and, as has been noted many times in the past, grants given by the foundation often directly benefit the value of the trust's assets. One of my favorite parts about my job at the Gates Foundation is that I get to travel to the developing world, and I do that quite regularly. My first trip in India, I was in a person's home where they had dirt floors, no running water, no electricity, and that's really what I see all over the world. So in short, I'm startled by all the things that they don't have. But I am surprised by one thing that they do have. (laughs) Coca-Cola. Coke is everywhere. In fact, when I travel in the developing world, Coke feels ubiquitous. And so when I come back from these trips and I'm thinking about development and I'm flying home and I'm thinking, well, we're trying to deliver condoms to people or vaccinations, you know, Coke's success kind of stops and makes you wonder, how is it that they can get Coke to these far-flung places? And if they can do that, why can't governments and NGOs do the same thing? And the charity of Microsoft founder Bill Gates and his wife Melinda is under criticism following the disclosure. It substantially increased its holdings in the agribusiness giant Monsanto to over $23 million. Critics say the investment in Monsanto contradicts the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's stated commitment to helping farmers and sustainable development in Africa. The study from the pressure group Global Justice Now paints a picture of the Gates Foundation partly as an expression of corporate America's desire to profit from Africa and partly a damning critique of its effects. You could have a case where the initial research is done by a Gates-funded institution. Um, The media reporting on how well that research is conducted is done. uh, The media uh, outlet is a Gates-funded outlet and maybe a Gates-funded journalist from a media programme and then the programme is implemented more widely by a Gates-funded NGO. I mean, there are are some very insular circles here. (laughs) 
Among the many criticisms, the idea that private finance can solve the problems of the developing world. Should poor farmers be trapped into debt by having to use chemicals or fertilizers underwritten by offshoots of the foundation? This is no mere theoretical conflict of interest. Gates is held up as a hero for donating $35.8 billion worth of his Microsoft stock to the foundation. But during the course of his decade of vaccines, Gates' net worth has actually doubled from $54 billion to $103.1 billion. The Rockefeller story provides an instructive template for this vision of tycoon-turned-philanthropist. When Rockefeller faced a public backlash, he helped spearhead the creation of a system of private foundations that connected in with his business interests. Leveraging his unprecedented oil monopoly fortune into unprecedented control over wide swaths of public life, Rockefeller was able to kill two birds with one stone, molding society in his family's own interests, even as he became a beloved figure in the public imagination. Similarly, Bill Gates has leveraged his software empire into a global health, development, and education empire, steering the course of investment and research and ensuring healthy markets for vaccines and other immunization products. And, like Rockefeller, Gates has been transformed from the feared and reviled head of a formidable hydra into a kindly old man, generously giving his wealth back to the public. But not everyone has been taken in by this PR trick. Even The Lancet observed this worrying transformation from software monopolist to health monopolist back in 2009, when the extent of this Gates-led monopoly was becoming apparent to all. The first guiding principle of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is that it is driven by the interests and passions of the Gates family. An annual letter from Bill Gates summarizes those passions, referring to newspaper articles, books, and chance events that have shaped the Foundation's strategy. For such a large and influential investor in global health, is such a whimsical governance principle good enough? This brings us back to the question, who is Bill Gates? What are his driving interests? What motivates his decisions? These are not academic questions. Gates' decisions have controlled the flows of billions of dollars, formed international partnerships pursuing wide-ranging agendas, ensured the creation of healthy markets for big pharma vaccine manufacturers. And now, as we are seeing, his decisions are shaping the entire global response to the coronavirus pandemic. Next week, we will further explore Gates' vaccination initiatives, the business interests behind them, and the larger agenda that is beginning to take shape as we enter the new normal of the COVID-19 crisis. $10 billion. I mean, just speak about the magnitude of that. That is by far the biggest uh, commitment of the foundation, isn't it, Bill? I mean, this is, this is by far the largest. That's right. We've been spending a lot on vaccines. Uh, with this commitment, uh, over 8 million additional lives will be saved. So it's one of the most effective ways that uh, health in the poorest countries can be dramatically improved. In January of 2010, Bill and Melinda Gates used the World Economic Forum at Davos to announce a staggering $10 billion commitment to research and develop vaccines for the world's poorest countries, kicking off what he called a decade of vaccines. Today we're announcing a commitment over this next decade, uh, which we think of as a, a decade of uh, vaccines having incredible impact. Uh, we're announcing that uh, we'll spend over $10 billion on vaccines. Hailed by the Gates-funded media. For the record, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a NewsHour underwriter. And applauded by the pharmaceutical companies who stood to reap the benefits of that largesse. The record-setting commitment made waves in the international community, helping to underwrite a global vaccine action plan coordinated by the Gates-funded World Health Organization. But contrary to the Gates' own PR spin that this $10 billion pledge was an unalloyed good and would save 8 million lives, the truth is that this attempt to reorient the global health economy was part of a much bigger agenda. 
an agenda that would ultimately lead to greater profits for big pharma companies, greater control for the Gates Foundation over the field of global health, and greater power for Bill Gates to shape the course of the future for billions of people around the planet. This is Bill Gates' plan to vaccinate the world. You're tuned into the Corbett Report. Given Gates's pledge to make this a decade of vaccines, it should come as no surprise that, since the dawn of this coronavirus crisis, he has been adamant that the world will not go back to normal until a vaccine has been developed. But we're going to have this intermediate period of opening up, uh, and it won't be normal until we get a, an amazing vaccine uh, to the entire world. The vaccine is, is critical because until you have that, things aren't really going to be normal. They can open up to some degree, but the risk of a rebound will be there until we have very broad vaccination. Well, they won't be back to normal until we either have that phenomenal vaccine or a therapeutic that's like over 95% effective. And so we have to assume that's going to be almost 18 months from now. And then the final solution, uh, which is a year to two years off, is the vaccine. So we've got to mm -hmm. go full speed ahead on all three fronts. Uh, just to head off the conspiracy theorists, maybe we shouldn't call the vaccine the final solution. Maybe just the Good best point. solution. <laughs> okay. More interestingly, since Gates began delivering this same talking point in every one of his many media appearances of late, it has been picked up and repeated by heads of state, health officials, doctors, and media talking heads, right down to the scientifically arbitrary but very specific 18-month time frame. Realistically, COVID-19 will be here for the next 18 months or more. We will not be able to return to normalcy until we find a vaccine or effective medications. The hard fact is, until we find a vaccine, going back to normal means putting lives at risk. This will be the new normal until a vaccine is developed. The only thing that will really allow life as we once knew it to resume is a vaccine. Obviously, we continue to work on the vaccines, but the vaccines have to be down the road by probably 14, 15, 16 months. We're doing great on the vaccines. The fact that so many heads of state, health ministers, and media commentators are dutifully echoing Gates's pronouncements about the need for a vaccine will not be surprising to those who saw last week's exploration of how Bill Gates monopolized global health. As we have seen, the Gates Foundation's tentacles have penetrated into every corner of the field of public health. Billions of dollars in funding and entire public policy agendas are under the control of this man, an unelected, unaccountable software developer with no medical research experience or training. And nowhere is Gates's control of public health more apparent than in the realm of vaccines. Gates launched the decade of vaccines with a $10 billion pledge. Gates helped develop the Global Vaccine Action Plan administered by the Gates-funded World Health Organization. Gates helped found Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, aiming to develop healthy markets for vaccine manufacturers. Gates helped launch Gavi with a $1 billion donation in 2011, going on to contribute $4.1 billion over the course of the decade of vaccines. And so I'm pleased to announce to you that we're pledging an additional billion dollars uh, to... Thank you. All right, thank you. It's not every day we give away a billion uh, dollars. One of the Gates Foundation's core funding areas is vaccine development and surveillance, which has resulted in the channeling of billions of dollars into vaccine development, a seat at the table to develop vaccination campaigns in countries around the globe, and the opportunity to shape public thinking about Bill Gates's pet project of the past five years, preparing rapid development and deployment of vaccines in the event of a globally spreading pandemic. 
If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus. Whether it occurs by the quirk of nature or at the hand of a terrorist, epidemiologists show through their models that a respiratory spread pathogen would kill more than 30 million people in less than a year. And there is a reasonable probability of that taking place in the years ahead. Many high profile personalities have been gathering at this year's World Economic Forum in Davos, which aims to discuss and deal with the globe's most pressing issues. Amongst them is the Microsoft founder Bill Gates. His foundation is investing millions in the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations to help combat infectious diseases. Here's some of what he had to say about his push to develop new vaccines. Unfortunately, it takes many years. To do a completely new vaccine. The design, the, the safety reviews, Costs. the manufacturing, all those things、uh, mean that、uh, an epidemic can be very widespread before that tool would come along. And so after Ebola, the global health community talked a lot about this,、uh, including a, a new type of、uh, vaccine platform called DNA RNA、mm. that should speed things along. And so Uh, this Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiative, CEPI, CEPI,、uh, is、uh, three countries Japan, Norway, Germany, and two foundations.、Uh, Welcome Trust,、uh, who we work with on a lot of things, and our foundation, Gates Foundation,、uh, coming together to fund uh, uh, actually trying to use that platform and make、uh, some vaccines, and so that would help us in the future. We know vaccines can protect us. We just need to be better prepared. So let's come together. Let's research and invest. Let's save lives. Let's, let's outsmart, outsmart epidemics. epidemics. Given Gates's mammoth investment in vaccines over the past decade, his insistence that things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to basically the entire world is hardly surprising. What should be surprising is that this strangely specific and continuously repeated message that we will not go back to normal until we get a vaccine in 18 months has no scientific basis whatsoever. Medical researchers have already conceded that a vaccine for SARS CoV 2 may not even be possible, pointing to the inability of researchers to develop any kind of immunization against previous coronavirus outbreaks like SARS or MERS. But even if such a vaccine were possible, serious concerns remain about the safety of developing, testing, and delivering such an amazing vaccine to the entire world in this remarkably short time frame. Even proponents of vaccine development openly worry that the rush to vaccinate billions of people with a largely untested experimental coronavirus vaccine will itself present grave risks to the public. One of these risks involves disease enhancement. It has been known for over a decade that vaccination for some viral infections, including coronaviruses, actually enhances susceptibility to viral infection or even causes infections in healthy vaccine recipients. Now, the issue of safety, something that I want to make sure the American public u n d e r s t a n d It's not only safety when you inject somebody and they get maybe an idiosyncratic reaction, they get a little allergic reaction, they get pain. There's safety associated. Does the vaccine make you worse? And there are diseases in which you vaccinate someone, they get infected with what you're trying to protect them with, and you actually enhance the infection. This is no mere theoretical risk. As researchers who were trying to develop a vaccine for the original SARS outbreak discovered, the vaccine actually made the lab animals subjected to it more susceptible to the disease. One of the things that we're not hearing a lot about is the unique 
potential safety problem of coronavirus vaccines. Uh, this was uh, first found in the early 1960s with the respiratory syncytial virus uh, vaccines, at children, and it was done here in Washington with the NIH and Children's National Medical Center, that some of those kids who got the vaccine actually did worse and I believe there were two deaths as in, in the consequence of that study. Because what happens with certain types of respiratory virus vaccines, you get immunized, and then when you get actually exposed to the virus, you get this kind of paradoxical immune enhancement phenomenon. And, what ha and, and we, we don't entirely understand the basis of it, but we recognize that it's a real problem for certain respiratory virus vaccines. That killed the RSV program for decades. Now the Gates Foundation is taking it up again. But when we started developing uh, coronavirus vaccines in our colleagues, we noticed in laboratory animals that they started to show some of the same immune pathology that resembled what had happened 50 years earlier. This specific issue regarding coronavirus vaccines is exacerbated by the arbitrary and unscientific 18-month time frame that Gates is insisting on for the vaccine's development. In order to meet that deadline, vaccine developers are being urged to use new and largely unproven methods for creating their experimental immunizations, including DNA and mRNA vaccines. For a self-described wartime president, victory over COVID-19 equals a vaccine. I hope we're going to have a vaccine and, and we're going to fast track it like you've never seen before. Adding Trump style branding, the administration launched Operation Warp Speed a multi-billion dollar research and manufacturing effort to shorten the typical year plus vaccine development timeline. We're going to start ramping up production with the companies involved and you do that at risk. In other words, you don't wait until you get an answer before you start manufacturing. You at risk proactively start making it assuming it's going to work. You're thinking 18 months, even with all the work that you've already done to this point and the planning that you are taking with lots of different potential uh, vaccinations and building up for that now? Yeah, so the, there's an approach called the RNA vaccine that people like Moderna, CureVac, uh, and others are using mm -hmm. that in 2015, we'd identified that as very promising uh, for pandemics and for uh, other applications as well. And so if everything goes perfectly uh, with the RNA approach, we could actually beat the 18 months. We don't want to create unrealistic expectations. So the concept of an RNA vaccine is let's inject the RNA molecule that encodes for the spike protein. It's making your cell do the work of creating this viral protein that is going to be recognized by your immune system and trigger um, the development of these antibodies. Our bodies won't make a full-fledged infectious virus, they'll just make a little piece and then learn to recognize it and then get ready to destroy the virus if it then later comes and invades us. It's a relatively new unproven technology and there's still no example of an RNA vaccine that's been deployed worldwide in the way that we need for the coronavirus. There's the possibility for unforeseen adverse effects. So this is all new territory. Whether it would elicit protective immune response against this virus is just unknown right now. Rushing at warp speed to develop a new vaccine using experimental technology and then mass producing and delivering billions of doses to be injected into basically the entire world, before adequate testing is even done, amounts to one of the most dangerous experiments in the history of the world, one that could alter the lives of untold numbers of people. That an experimental vaccine, developed in a brand new way and rushed through with a special shortened testing regime, should be given to adults, children, pregnant women, newborn babies, and the elderly alike, would be, in any other situation, unthinkable. To suggest that such a vaccine should be given to the entire planet would have been called lunacy mere months ago. But now the public is being asked to accept this premise without question. Even Gates himself acknowledges the inherent risks of such a project. But his concern is not for the lives that will be irrevocably altered in the event that the vaccines cause damage to the population. Instead, he is more concerned that the pharmaceutical companies and the researchers are given legal immunity for any such damage. You know, if we have, you know, one in 10,000 uh, side effects, that's, you know, 
way more, 700,000 uh, you know, people who will suffer from that. So really understanding the safety at gigantic scale across all age r- ranges, you know, pregnant, male, female, undernourished, uh, existing comorbidities, it's very, very hard. And that actual decision of, okay, let's go and give this vaccine to the entire world, uh, governments will have to be involved because there will be some risk and indemnification needed before that can uh, be decided on. As we have already seen, in the arena of global health, what Bill Gates wants is what the world gets. So it should be no surprise that immunity for the big pharma vaccine manufacturers and the vaccination program planners is already being worked on. In the U.S., the Department of Health and Human Services issued a declaration that retroactively provides liability immunity for activities related to medical countermeasures against COVID-19, including manufacturers, distributors, and program planners of any vaccine used to treat, diagnose, cure, prevent, or mitigate COVID-19. The declaration was issued on March 17th, but retroactively covers any activity back to February 4th, 2020, the day before the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation announced an emergency $100 million to fund treatment efforts and to develop new vaccines for COVID-19. The plan to inject everyone on the planet with an experimental vaccine is no aberration in Bill Gates' envisioned decade of vaccines. It is its culmination. The decade of vaccines kicked off with a Gates-funded $3.6 million observational study of HPV vaccines in India that, according to a government investigation, violated the human rights of the study participants with gross violations of consent and failed to properly report adverse events experienced by the vaccine recipients. After the deaths of seven girls involved in the trial were reported, a parliamentary investigation concluded that the Gates-funded Program for Appropriate Technology and Health, or PATH, which ran the study, had been engaged in a scheme to help ensure healthy markets for GlaxoSmithKline and Merck, the manufacturers of the Gardasil and Cervarix vaccines that had been so generously donated for use in the trial. Had PATH been successful in getting the HPV vaccine included in the Universal Immunization Program of the Concerned Countries, this would have generated windfall profit for the manufacturers by way of automatic sale, year after year, without any promotional or marketing expenses. It is well known that once introduced into the immunization program, it becomes politically impossible to stop any vaccination. Chandra M. Gulhadi, editor of the influential Monthly Index of Medical Specialties, remarked that it is shocking to see how an American organization used surreptitious methods to establish itself in India. And Samarin Nundi, editor emeritus of the National Medical Journal of India, lamented that this is an obvious case where Indians were being used as guinea pigs. Throughout the decade, India's concerns about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and its corporate partners' influence on the country's national immunization programs grew. In 2016, the steering group of the country's national health mission blasted the government for allowing the country's National Technical Advisory Group on Immunization the primary body advising the government on all vaccination-related matters, to be effectively purchased by the Gates Foundation. As one steering group member noted, the NTAGI Secretariat has been moved out of the government's health ministry to the Office of Public Health Foundation of India, and the 32 staff members in that secretariat draw their salaries from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There is a clear conflict of interest. On one hand, the BMGF funds the secretariat that is the highest decision-making body in vaccines, and, on the other, it partners with the pharma industry in Gavi. This is unacceptable. In 2017, the government responded by cutting all financial ties between the advisory group and the Gates Foundation. Similar stories play out across the Gates Foundation's decade of vaccines. There's the Gates-founded and funded meningitis vaccine project, which led to the creation and testing of MenAfrovac, a 50 cent per dose immunization against meningococcal meningitis. The test led to reports of between 40 and 500 children suffering seizures and convulsions and eventually becoming paralyzed. There's the 2017 confirmation that the Gates-supported oral polio vaccine was actually responsible for the majority of new polio cases, and the 2018 follow-up showing that 80% of polio cases are now vaccine-derived. There's the 2018 paper in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health 
concluding that over 490,000 people in India developed paralysis as a result of the oral polio vaccine between 2000 and 2017. There's even the WHO's own malaria chief, Dr. Arata Kochi, who complained in an internal memo that Gates' influence meant that the world's leading malaria scientists are now locked up in a cartel with their own research funding being linked to those of others within the group, and that the foundation was stifling debate on the best ways to treat and combat malaria, prioritizing only those methods that relied on new technology or developing new drugs. Kochi's complaint, written in 2008, highlights the most common criticism of the global health web that Gates has spun in the past two decades. That the public health industry has become a racket run by and for Big Pharma and its partners for the benefit of big business. At the time that Kochi was writing his memo, the executive director of the Gates Foundation's global health program was Tachi Yamada. Yamada left his position as chairman of research and development at GlaxoSmithKline to take up the position at the Gates Foundation in 2006, and left the foundation five years later to become chief medical and scientific officer at Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Yamada's replacement as head of Gates' global health program, Trevor Mundell, was himself a clinical researcher at Pfizer and Park Davis, and spent time as head of development with Novartis before joining the foundation. This use of foundation funds to set public policy to drive up corporate profits is not a secret conspiracy. It is a perfectly open one. When the Center for Global Development formed a working group to develop a practical approach to the vaccine challenge, they concluded that the best way to incentivize pharmaceutical companies to produce more vaccines for the third world was for governments to promise to buy vaccines before they were even developed. They titled their report, Making Markets for Vaccines. The project, uh, Making Markets for Vaccines, was really designed to address a, pro a problem that's existed for a long time, which is insufficient research and development budgets, as well as investment capacity in vaccine development and production for the third world. How do you create better incentives to get the pharma community, the vaccine community, to produce products that are specifically dedicated for the developing world. Michael Kremer, a professor at Harvard, had been thinking about this problem for many years. He realized that if the rich countries of the world were to make a promise that they would buy a malaria vaccine if somebody produced it, that that would give an incentive to the pharmaceutical industry to go and do the research and development needed to make one. But this idea was unfamiliar. No government had made a commitment to buy a product that didn't already exist. When the first such advanced market commitment was made in 2007, a $1.5 billion promise to buy yet-to-be-produced vaccines from big pharma manufacturers, there was the Gates Foundation as the only non-nation sponsor. The Gates-founded Gavi Vaccine Alliance is an open partnership between the Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, and vaccine manufacturers. Their stated goal includes introducing new vaccines into the routine schedules of national immunization programs and to engage in market-shaping efforts to ensure healthy markets for vaccines and other immunization products. If introducing new vaccines and ensuring healthy markets for them was the aim of Gates's decade of vaccines, there can be no doubt that COVID-19 has seen that goal realized in spectacular fashion. Let's start the pledging. The EU kicked off its fundraising drive with one billion euros. In the hours that followed, pledges were beamed in from across the globe. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has pledged $500 million. Even pop icon Madonna made a last-minute donation of a million euros. By combining the world's expertise and brain power and resources, we can attack this disease in the way it's attacking us, globally. Our foundation is proud to partner with you, and I'm pleased to announce today that we will pledge $100 million towards this effort. Germany was one of the leading donors, pledging over 500 million euros. The money is earmarked for international health organizations and research networks in a bid to speed up the development of a vaccine. And there, at the center of this web, is the Gates Foundation, connected to every major organization, research institution, international alliance, and vaccine manufacturer involved in the current crisis. Certainly, the Gates, like the Rockefellers, have profited from their years as the most generous people on the planet. As curious as it might seem to those who don't understand the true nature of this monopoly cartel, 
Despite all of these grants and pledges, commitments of tens of billions of dollars, Bill Gates' personal net worth has actually doubled during this decade of vaccines, from $50 billion to over $100 billion. But once again, we come back to the question, who is Bill Gates? Is he motivated simply by money? Is this incessant drive to vaccinate the entire population of the planet merely the result of greed? Or is there something else driving this agenda? As we shall see next time, money is not the end goal of Gates's philanthropic activities. Money is just the tool that he is using to purchase what he really wants. Control. Control not just of the health industry, but control of the human population itself. What's your secret mission about? It's not my mission, but an idea that came from my good friend, Mr. Bill Gates. Hi, kids. The real, actual, in-person Bill... Uh, Bill? <laughs> He's trying to say that we're big fans, Mr. Gates. It's a strange fact that Bill Gates hagiographers... PR hacks employed more often than not by large corporations that receive funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation consistently depict this drab software developer as a cartoon superhero using his superpower of being very rich to help save the planet. Behind closed doors on this New York campus, a secret gathering of some of the world's most powerful people. Gates, Buffett, Bloomberg, Winfrey. It was like, well, it was like... The Super Friends. In the great hall of the Justice League, there are assembled the world's four greatest heroes. But these cartoon-fueled puff pieces reveal more than they know about Gates and the other mega-rich philanthropists they are attempting to idolize. They reveal that the idea of the selfless billionaire do-gooder is a work of fiction so unbelievable it is only fit for Saturday morning cartoon fare. As we have seen in our first two explorations of Bill Gates' role as global health kingpin, the seemingly selfless generosity of the Gates family through their eponymous foundation has in fact greatly increased their own wealth, with Bill Gates' personal net worth having doubled in the past decade alone. But the takeover of public health that we have documented in How Bill Gates Monopolized Global Health, and the remarkably brazen push to vaccinate everyone on the planet that we have documented in Bill Gates' plan to vaccinate the world, was not, at base, about money. The unimaginable wealth that Gates has accrued is now being used to purchase something much more useful. Control. Control not just of the global health bodies that can coordinate a worldwide vaccination program, or the governments that will mandate such an unprecedented campaign, but control over the global population itself. This is an exploration of Bill Gates and the population control grid. You're tuned into The Corbett Report. From a journalistic standpoint, Good Morning America's inane report on the secretive billionaire meeting that took place in New York in 2009 was a failure. It listed some of the meeting's attendees and their combined net worth. Gates, Buffett, Bloomberg, Winfrey, together with others at the meeting, including George Soros, Ted Turner, David Rockefeller, they're worth more than $125 billion. It turned to the senior editor of Forbes for a soundbite about what it would be like to witness such an assembly of wealth. To have been in the room and, and see this meeting of the minds really would have been a fascinating thing. And it dutifully reported the participants' own stated reason for holding the meeting. That much money, that much power around one table, it begs the question, what were they doing? What were they scheming? Total world domination? This group, together for six hours, was talking about charity, education, emergency relief, global health. Before wrapping up with another juvenile appeal to comic book superhero lore. The new Superman and Wonder Woman, the super rich friends, not fighting bad guys, but fighting for good nonetheless. For Good Morning America, John Berman, ABC News. 
Yes, from a journalistic standpoint, Berman's report was an utter failure. There was no attempt to question the participants about the meeting. No space for any criticism of these billionaires or questions about their motives. No adversarial journalism of any kind. But as a PR piece, it was brilliant. It leaves the viewer with a vague sense that some kind of gathering took place somewhere in New York in which rich people, who, let's not forget, are superheroes, talked about charity. One would have to turn to print sources to discover that the meeting was held at the personal residence of Sir Paul Nurse, then president of Rockefeller University, that the invitation to the gathering was co-written by Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and David Rockefeller, or that the aim of the meeting was to consider how their wealth could be used to slow the growth of the world's population. Given that these extraordinarily rich and powerful men, including Warren Buffett, David Rockefeller, and Ted Turner, have all expressed their belief that the growing human population is the greatest threat faced by humanity, it should not be surprising that they would convene a conference to discuss how best to channel their vast wealth into the project of reducing the number of people on the planet. Particularly unsurprising is that attendees of the meeting later dubbed Bill Gates, a man for whom population control is particularly close to his heart, as the most impressive speaker at the event. Here we can see a chart that looks at the total world population over the last several hundred years. And at first glance, this is a bit scary. We go from less than a billion in 1800, and then three, four, five, six, and 7.4 billion where we are today is happening even faster. So Melinda and I wondered whether providing new medicines and keeping children alive, would that create more of a population problem? And what the developing world does not need is more children. Hmm. And I think that was the biggest aha to Bill and me when we got into this work, is we asked ourselves, of course, the same hard-nosed question you'd ask, which is, if you get into this work and you start to save these children, will women just keep overpopulating the world? And thank goodness the converse is absolutely true. This is a very important question to get right, because it was, it was absolutely key for me. When our foundation first started up, it was focused on reproductive health. That was the main thing we did because I thought, you know, population growth in poor countries is the biggest problem they face. You've got to help mothers who want to limit family size have the tools and education to do that. And I thought that's the only thing that really counts. In recent years, critics have pointed to Bill Gates' own words linking vaccination programs with his goal of reducing population growth. Now, the world today has 6.8 billion people that's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. $10 billion over the next 10 years uh, to make it the year of the vaccines. W what does that mean exactly? Well, over this decade, uh, we believe unbelievable progress can be made, both inventing new vaccines and making sure they get out to all the children who need them. Uh, we could cut the number of children who die every year from about 9 million to half of that uh, if we have success on it. And the, the benefits there in terms of reducing sickness, reducing the population growth, it really allows a society a chance to take care of itself uh, once you've made that intervention. But as any number of fact-checking websites, not to mention Bill Gates himself, are quick to point out, this doesn't mean what it sounds like it means. What we found out is that as health improves, families choose to have less children. The truth is that when people's lives improve, when children survive, for instance, or when girls go to school, people start making decisions based on the expectation that their children will live and thrive. The result is smaller families and slower population growth. I came across articles that showed that the key thing you can do to reduce population growth is actually improve health. And that sounds paradoxical. You think, okay, better health means more kids, not less kids. Well, in fact, what parents are doing is they're, op they're trying to have two kids survive to adulthood to take care of them. And so the more disease burden there is, the more kids they have to have to have that high probability. So there's a perfect correlation that as you improve health within a half generation, the population growth rate goes down. 
Yes, the gate's stated plan is to reduce population growth by improving health. But the idea of using vaccines as sterilization agents, even without the public's knowledge or consent, is not conspiracy lore, but documentable fact. In its 1968 annual report, the Rockefeller Foundation addressed the problems of population, lamenting that very little work is in progress on immunological methods, such as vaccines, to reduce fertility, and much more research is required if a solution is to be found here. The Foundation vowed to correct this problem by funding established and beginning investigators to turn their attention to aspects of research in reproductive biology that have implications for human fertility and its control. This was no empty promise. By the time of its 1988 annual report, the Rockefeller Foundation was able to report progress on its funding into contraceptive research, including Norplant, a contraceptive implanted under the skin of a woman's upper arm and effective for five years. In its 1988 report, the Rockefeller Foundation was pleased to announce that Norplant, which was developed by the Rockefeller-founded Population Council, was now approved for marketing in 12 countries. The Rockefeller's Population Council and other research organizations joined with the World Health Organization in 1972 to create a task force on vaccines for fertility regulation. By 1995, they were able to report progress in developing a prototype of an anti-HCG vaccine, which works by combining an immunogen formed from a synthetic peptide of human chorionic gonadotrophin, HCG, a hormone secreted by the surface of the early embryo to remain implanted in the womb, with a toxoid carrier molecule. The vaccine stimulates an immune reaction, causing women to develop antibodies against the hormone, thus preventing them from carrying babies to term. But beginning in the 1990s, a series of scandals over WHO-led vaccination programs in the Third World led to allegations that tetanus vaccines in places like the Philippines and Kenya were being laced with HCG in order to implement population control by stealth. The controversy generated by these stories led global institutions to step back from the campaign to champion population control by vaccine. But, as usual, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was there to renew interest, working with the UK government to host a London summit on family planning in 2012, at which the foundation announced their support for funding the research, development, and deployment of injectable contraceptives to the developing world. You heard me talk earlier about Sadie, who I met in Niger. She was traveling 15 kilometers to get an injection. But let's ask ourselves, what if she didn't have to travel to that clinic? If we put it in her perspective, how can we keep her in her village to get the contraceptive she wants? Well, Pfizer is testing a new form of Depo. The injection that she goes 15 kilometers to get, they're now putting it in a new form, a new device that can be given. It's very, very small. It's called Uniject. I think it's going to be pictured here. It's a high quality product. It's effective. It's safe. It's tiny, as you can see. And it can be put in a healthcare worker's kit to give to the woman at the village level. So Sadie won't have to go 15 kilometers any longer to get that injection. But the gates were not content to stop there. In 2014, it was announced that Microchips Biotech Inc., a company in Lexington, Massachusetts, had developed a new form of birth control. A wireless implant that can be turned on and off with a remote control and that is designed to last up to 16 years. According to MIT Technology Review, the idea originated when Bill Gates visited Robert Langer's MIT lab in 2012 and asked him if it would be possible to create an implantable birth control device that could be turned on or off remotely. Langer referred Gates to the controlled release microchip technology he had invented and licensed to Microchips Biotechnology, and the Gates Foundation granted $20 million to the firm to develop the implants. Reducing population growth has, by Gates's own admission, been a core mission of the Gates Foundation since its inception. But in order to really understand what Gates means by population control, we have to look beyond the concept of controlling population size. At its most fundamental level, the population control that Gates speaks of is not birth control, but control of the population itself. In order to understand the broader population control agenda and how it ties into the Gates Foundation's plans, we have to look at a puzzling development that took place in 2017. In that year, Gavi, 
the Gates founded and funded alliance that partners the Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, and the World Bank with vaccine manufacturers to help ensure healthy markets for vaccines, took a strange pivot away from its core mission of vaccinating every child on the planet to providing every child with a digital biometric identity. The idea was first floated by Gavi CEO Seth Berkeley in a Nature article that year, Immunization Needs a Technology Boost, where he states that the goal of 100% immunization will not be reached without secure digital identification systems that can store a child's medical history. He then gives a specific example. We are working with a company in India called Kushi Baby, which creates off-grid digital health records. A necklace worn by infants contains a unique identification number on a short-range communication chip. Community health workers can scan the chip using a mobile phone, enabling them to update a child's digital record even in remote areas with little phone coverage. This sudden interest in digital identity was no mere passing fancy for the Vaccine Alliance. Gavi doubled down by becoming a founding member of the ID2020 Alliance, a public-private partnership dedicated to spearheading a global digital biometric identity standard. Other founding members of the Alliance include Gates' first company, Microsoft, and the Rockefeller Foundation. In 2018, Gavi issued a call for innovation in digital technologies for finding, identifying, and registering the most vulnerable children. The call specifically requested technologies for capturing, storing, and enrolling the biometric details of infants on rugged biometric devices. Berkeley continued to follow up on this idea in public engagements as one of the new core missions of Gavi. What's interesting is that people tend to think of, you know, birth certificates as kind of a major document. But, you know, the most common, as, as I mentioned before, is not a birth certificate, is not a death certificate, is not a marriage certificate. The most common connection, vital registration for the population is actually a child health card because we reach more than 90 percent of children with at least one dose of vaccine as part of routine. So they're in the system. The challenge is that contact is not connected into the system. So if you could connect it, then you have the ability to give them their basic identity papers. You have ability then later on if they want to own land or they want to have their rights, you're able to help them with that. But, you know, we're not currently taking advantage of that. And so the children get seen, they get enrolled in the health centers, but that information is not used for anything else. Although vaccines and identity may seem unrelated, Bill Gates has spent the last few years funding research that can bring the two ideas together. Late last year, Gates once again turned to Robert Langer and his MIT colleagues to investigate new ways to permanently store and record the vaccination information of each individual. The result of their research was a new vaccine delivery method. They found that by using dissolvable microneedles that deliver patterns of near-infrared light-emitting microparticles to the skin, they could create particle patterns in the skin of vaccine recipients which are invisible to the eye but can be imaged using modified smartphones. Rice University describes the quantum dot tags left behind by the microneedles as something like a barcode tattoo. So who was behind this development? As lead researcher Kevin McHugh explains, The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation came to us and said, Hey, we have a real problem, knowing who's vaccinated. So our idea was to put the record on the person. This way, later on, People can scan over the area to see what vaccines have been administered and give only the ones still needed. The microparticles that form the fluorescent quantum dot tags are delivered along with the vaccine, but they cannot be delivered by a traditional syringe. Instead, they must be delivered by a patch of microneedles made from a mixture of dissolvable sugar and a polymer called PVA, as well as the quantum dot dye in the vaccine. It should be no surprise, then, that big pharma vaccine manufacturers in their scramble to produce the coronavirus vaccine that, Gates assures us, is necessary to go back to normal, have turned to a novel vaccine delivery method, a dissolvable microneedle array patch. The University of Pittsburgh is where the polio vaccine was first discovered. At the medical center, researchers are now developing a vaccine that is delivered using a dissolvable patch called a microneedle array. Think about them as almost like a Band-Aid. And so the microneedle array is simply applied to the skin topically, pressed into place very shortly, and then taken off and thrown away. And then the antigen is already delivered. As is becoming evident, 
This new vaccine-delivered barcode-like tattoo is about much more than simply ensuring that children get all their Gavi-recommended immunizations. On a recent Ask Me Anything thread on Reddit, when asked, What changes are we going to have to make to how businesses operate to maintain our economy while providing social distancing? Bill Gates answered, Eventually we will have some digital certificates to show who has recovered or been tested recently, or when we have a vaccine, who has received it. In his answer, Gates fails to mention that he has himself been instrumental in kickstarting and funding the research into the very type of digital certificates for vaccination that he is speaking about, or that these digital certificates, likely, at first, to be a digital marker linked to a biometric ID, could very well one day take the form of vaccine-implanted quantum dot tattoos. But, as in so many other aspects of the unfolding crisis, Gates's unscientific pronouncement that we will need digital certificates to prove our immunity in the new normal of the post-coronavirus world. Eventually, what we'll have to have is certificates of who's a recovered person, who's a vaccinated person. Is now being implemented by a number of governments. It is now being reported that on Fido, a tech startup specializing in AI-based biometric ID verification, is in talks with the British government to provide the type of digital certification Gates mentioned dubbed an immunity passport. The proposed system would require would-be workers to use the OnFido-provided app to scan their face or other biometric data, link that information to a SARS-CoV-2 antibody test, or, eventually, proof of coronavirus vaccination, and then have their picture taken and immunity verified every time they wish to access a restricted space or work environment. Last month, on Fido announced that it had raised $50 million in a round of investments led by Bill Gates' old company, Microsoft. But this is not Gates' first experience with the field of biometric identity. A decade ago, the government of India began what has been called the largest social experiment on Earth, enrolling over 1 billion people in the largest biometric identification database ever constructed. The project, involving iris scanning and fingerprinting the entirety of the Indian population, recording their biometric details in a centralized database, and issuing them a 12-digit identity number that could be used to prove residents and access government services, all within the span of a few years, presented an incredible societal, legal, and technological challenge. It's no surprise, then, that the person who was brought in as the chief architect of the Adhar project when it was launched, Nandan Nilakani, co-founder of Indian multinational Infosys, is also a longtime friend of Bill Gates, and a partner with Bill and Melinda Gates on a philanthropic venture called CoImpact, which supports initiatives to address major social challenges at scale. Nilakani's involvement in Adhar has even made him one of Gates's heroes, featured in slick video promotions produced by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. My friend, Nandan Nilakani, is one of India's best-known entrepreneurs. He led the creation of the world's largest biometric ID system, now, he's working to promote his platform to improve the lives of the world's poorest people. There are more than a billion people around the world who don't have any kind of ID. You can't do anything in life without an ID because people are mobile, they're migrant, and wherever they go, whether they want a job or whether they want to board a train or whether they want to get a bank account or get a mobile connection, if the person has no way of proving who they are, then they just won't get access to those services. So the challenge we had was, how do we give a billion people, many of whom don't have birth certificates, how do we give them ID? And Gates has personally praised the Adhar scheme as a huge asset for India. Well, Adhar is a huge asset for India. Uh, it was designed very well. The fact that uh, you can make digital payments so easily, you can open a bank account. Yeah. Uh, India is a leader in that. Our foundation you know, worked with the Reserve Bank, uh, you know, Nandanil and Connie and uh, a group of people that he pulled together did a great job. But Gates is not merely an arm's length admirer of the Adhar experiment. He is not only personally connected to its chief architect, he is also connected to one of the key companies that spearheaded the technology that underlies the project's biometric database. The company that provides the iris recognition technology at the core of the Adhar system, Idemia, also provides facial recognition systems for the Chinese government and is currently developing digital driver's licenses for use in the United States. 
Idemia even created the cushy baby identification necklaces with embedded microchips that Gavi CEO Seth Berkley touted in his Nature article. Unsurprisingly, the company received support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through its involvement in the GSMA Inclusive Tech Lab. And now, Gates is funding a scheme to retool Adhar for a global rollout. In 2014, the World Bank created a multi-sector working group to launch the Identification for Development Initiative, or ID4D, which aims to support progress toward identification systems using 21st century solutions. The World Bank cites Goal 16.9 of the UN Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, vowing to provide legal identity for all, including birth registration, in the next 10 years, as the basis for its initiative. But ID4D was little more than a pipe dream until 2016, when the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation provided catalytic contributions to launch the ID4D Multi-Donor Trust Fund, which enticed the UK, French, and Australian governments, along with the Omidyar Network, into a partnership aiming to shape global approaches and a shared vision on identification. Unsurprisingly, this World Bank ID4D initiative includes Nandar Nilakani, Gates's partner and the chief architect of Adhar, on its advisory council, and Gates has said that he is funding the World Bank to take this Adhar approach to other countries. This headlong rush to capture the biometric details and assign digital identification to every person on Earth is sold to the public under the guise of financial inclusion. The poorest people on the planet have trouble accessing financial services and receiving government aid because they don't have official government identification papers. In this formulation, being issued a government ID having one's biometric details registered, tracked, and databased by the government, is a human right that must be secured. It should be no surprise by this point that this human right also has direct benefits for big business and for the entities that are looking to exert greater control over the human population. Gates provided insight into the real purpose of this identification control grid in a speech at the Financial Inclusion Forum hosted by the U.S. Treasury in 2015. Every country really needs to look through these uh, KYC Know Your Customer rules uh, to make sure that uh, customers are able to prove who they are. But, of course, in many countries, you don't have any type of ID system. And the lack of an ID system is a problem, not just for the payment system, but also for voting and health and education and taxation. And so it's a wonderful thing to go in and create a broad identification system. Again, India is a very uh, interesting example of this, where the Adhar system, which is a 12-digit identifier that's correlated to biometric measures, uh, is becoming pervasive throughout the country and will be the foundation uh, for how we bring this uh, low-cost switch to every mobile phone user in India. Uh, The same type of thing is happening now in, in Pakistan, Uh, And there's early beginnings of creating these ID programs in Africa as well. Uh, We expect to be able to use the ID so that when you show up for any government service, say you you walk into a primary health clinic, uh, we'll be able to take that bio ID very quickly and bring up your electronic health record. Even if you've moved from one part of the country to the other, you will be well tracked and well served uh, without nearly as much paperwork paperwork or Uh, waiting. And so the ID system is foundational. The ID control grid is an essential part of the digitization of the economy. And although this is being sold as an opportunity for financial inclusion of the world's poorest in the banking system provided by the likes of Gates and his banking and business associates, it is in fact a system for financial exclusion. Exclusion of any person or transaction that does not have the approval of the government or the payment providers. Once financial flows go underground, uh, where you have lots of legitimate transactions mixed in with the ones you want to track, and once they're going over a digital system that the U.S. has no connection to, it's far more difficult uh, to find the transactions that, that you want to be aware of or that you want to block. And once again, this is no mere theoretical talk from Gates. He has been intimately involved in this process of switching the world over to a digital payment grid tied to biometric identity. In 2012, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation helped found the Better Than Cash Alliance, which brings together governments, international organizations, and the private sector to accelerate the transition from cash to digital payments globally. 
And when the Indian government made a bold move to demonetize large amounts of its circulating currency in order to draw off the book's funds back under the purview of the Indian tax office, there was Gates to praise the move as an important step toward the creation of a brave new digital economy, tied, of course, to the Adhar ID grid. The bold move to demonetize high-value denominations and replace them with new notes uh, with higher security features is an important step uh, to move away from a shadow economy to uh, an even more transparent economy. And digital transactions uh, really, I think, will rise dramatically here. In fact, I think in the next several years, uh, India will become the most digitized economy, not just by size, but by percentage as well. All of the pieces are now coming together. Uh, one piece of this that uh, we uh, enjoyed consulting with the government on uh, making sure it comes together in the right way is the pending rollout of payment banks. Uh, this, for the first time, really will m mean that you have uh, full currency capability on those uh, digital phones. Once you have that digital infrastructure, the whole way you think about government benefits uh, can be done differently. Over time, all of these transactions will create a footprint. And so when you go in for credit, uh, the ability to access your history that you've paid your utility bills on time, uh, that you've saved up money for your children's education, all of those things in your digital trail accessed in an appropriate way will allow the credit market to properly score the risk and therefore loosen up more money uh, for investments, not only in the agriculture sector, but for uh, all the entrepreneurs in the country. The different parts of this population control grid fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. The vaccination drive ties into the biometric identity drive, which ties into the cashless society drive. In Gates's vision, everyone will receive the government-mandated vaccinations, and everyone will have their biometric details recorded in nationally administered, globally integrated, digital IDs. These digital identities will be tied to all of our actions and transactions, and if and when they are deemed illegal, they will simply be shut off by the government, or even the payment providers themselves. The Indian experiment in pioneering this biometric digital economy, an experiment with which Gates has been so intimately involved, also provides a perfect example of just how such a system will be abused. In January 2018, a report in the Tribune revealed that all of the details, including the name, address, postal code, photo, phone number, and email of all billion-plus Adhar-registered Indians, was available for purchase on WhatsApp for 500 rupees, or about 7 US dollars. The unique identification authority of India that administers the Adhar scheme was then forced to admit that approximately 210 websites, including websites of the central government and state government departments, were displaying the list of government beneficiaries, along with their name, address, other details, and Adhar numbers. Even more worryingly, newly obtained documents show that the Indian government is integrating Adhar collected data to create a 360-degree database that will automatically track when a citizen moves between cities or buys new property, and integrate that data into a real-time geospatial database built by the country's space agency, ISRO. Only the most willfully obtuse could claim to be unable to see the nightmarish implications for this type of all-seeing, all-pervasive society, where every transaction and every movement of every citizen is monitored, analyzed, and databased in real time by the government. And Bill Gates is one of those willfully obtuse people. A current debate that's on in India and globally as well around data. Now, you've been an advocate of Aadhaar. Uh, you've supported it, you've defended it. And I think that the questions arise not on, on uh, whether it's a good idea or not, but whether it should be made mandatory for every citizen, for every service possible, because it was envisaged as people accessing government subsidy uh, using the Aadhaar card to avoid duplication and leakages. Uh, the question then is that 
India today is still grappling with putting in place a privacy framework, a privacy regulation, a data protection regulation. Uh, in that context, then, does it make sense, even though the matter is in court today, to link Aadhaar to every possible service? Well, Aadhaar is just something that avoids you pretending to be somebody else, that, you know, you can have... Uh, you know, fake people on the pay government payroll. Mm -hmm. Adhar, you know, prevents you being on that payroll as as a ghost worker. It prevents you from collecting things that you shouldn't collect or accessing a health record you shouldn't have access to. So the basic Adhar mechanism mm. is an identity mechanism. And so it's too bad if somebody thinks that because Adhar is there, that in and of itself creates a privacy problem. Gates's response is, of course, disingenuous. The very purpose of a globally integrated ID grid and cashless payment architecture is to remove privacy from our lives. It should be no surprise, then, that this man who is not concerned about the privacy implications of a global, real-time electronic ID and digital payments grid is also a prime investor in EarthNow LLC, a company promising to deploy a large constellation of advanced imaging satellites that will deliver real-time, continuous video of almost anywhere on Earth. No, this Gates-driven agenda is not about money. It is about control. Control over every aspect of our daily lives, from where we go, to who we meet, to what we buy and what we do. The great irony is that this billionaire philanthropist so often depicted as a cartoon superhero for his dazzling generosity, actually resembles nothing so much as a comic book supervillain, right down to the use of his vast wealth to sponsor Harvard University research into dimming the sun by spraying particles into the stratosphere. But once again, we are driven back to the question, who is this person? What ideology is driving this quest for control? And what is the end goal of this quest? Who is Bill Gates? Computer whiz kid, talented software developer, shrewd businessman, benevolent philanthropist, global health expert. There could be no doubt that Bill Gates has worn many hats on his remarkable journey from his early life as the privileged son of a Seattle-area power couple to his current status as one of the richest and most influential people on the planet. But as we have seen in our exploration of Gates's rise as unelected global health czar and population control advocate, the question of who Bill Gates really is is no mere philosophical pursuit. Given that we are currently living through a crisis that has been predicted by Bill Gates, which is triggering a response from the global health organizations that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has bankrolled, and driving us toward a vaccination and biometric ID solution which Bill Gates has been working on for years, the answer to the question, who is Bill Gates, is quickly becoming one of the most important questions of our lives. That answer will not only tell us about the world that we are living in, but about the one that we are being thrust into, and how we can avoid it. Today we will attempt to answer that question as we examine the motives, the ideology, and the connections of this man who has been so instrumental in shaping the post-coronavirus world. Meet Bill Gates. You're tuned into The Corbett Report. So who is Bill Gates? Some argue that he's a genius who leveraged his natural computer savvy into a billion-dollar fortune. You're called a genius, and I will... Well, no, I don't think that embarrassed you at all. <laughs> they call you a genius. Part of your genius is that you are a computer whiz, and the other is that you did have the, 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 the business acumen to, to turn it into a working company. Uh, is, are you a business genius, too? Well, I wouldn't say genius. Others insist that he is a visionary who has changed our lives with his foresight and bold imagination. Bill had a vision... And I understand it went back even then that computing would be a, ubiquitous. It would be part of all of our lives. 
And indeed, as you all know, he executed on that vision, and the world today has changed so dramatically in large part due to the work that Bill has done throughout the years. He has been hailed as a shrewd executive who built the Microsoft empire with his remarkable talent for business. When the biographers and historians write the history of the 20th century, Bill Gates is going to go down as the best businessman of our century. And Microsoft is one of the greatest companies of the 20th century. And he has been praised as a philanthropist who is selflessly devoting his wealth to improving the lives of people around the world. Bill, even your harshest critic would have to admit that your philanthropy work is you know, planet-shaking, incredible, and uh, could, could be, if you make it, a, a second act so amazing that it would dwarf what you've actually done at Microsoft. Um, but, like anyone of his status, he has his detractors. In the 1990s, he was often portrayed as the greedy head of the evil Microsoft monopoly. Bill Gates isn't content with his Windows system running just a few PCs. He wants it to run the world, spreading like a computer virus into our faxes, our phones, our TV sets, and yes, even our toasters. But in the age of the coronavirus crisis, he is most often treated like some sort of epidemiologist or leading health researcher. Back here with us once again to talk about uh, this as well as testing, treatments, and more. Bill Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Bill, thanks so much for, for being back with us. It's been a, a little over a month since you were here, and at that time you mm -hmm. said the U.S. had not hit its peak. So at this point, do you think we have peaked, and where do you think we are right now in kind of the arc of the pandemic? But in truth... None of these perspectives are accurate. Microsoft's big break famously came from a deal to provide software for IBM as they moved into the personal computer market. But the deal was not the result of Gates's technical genius or amazing business acumen. As has been quietly admitted by IBM executives in the years since, Microsoft was given their shot at the chance to work with Big Blue as a result of Gates's mother's relationship with IBM CEO John Opel. You remember your partnership of IBM and Bill Gates. How did it break up? <laughs> I do remember very well, actually. Um, Bill Gates, at the time, at the beginning of the, our relationship with him, was living on pizza and Pepsi-Cola in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And his mother happened to be on the, on the United Way board with our chairman and asked his, our chairman to help him. And, you know, when the chairman comes in and tells you to go help this kid, 900 people get on the plane Monday morning and they all go down to try to help Bill Gates. So I don't see Bill Gates as this great creative person. I see him as an opportunist. And in fact, in those days, there was a lot of sharing of software code. People gave it away. In Silicon Valley, they would share everything. He came in and he tried to control everything and put a price on it. Computer historians have long known how the basis for what became MS-DOS was not Bill Gates's brilliant imagination, but QDOS, a quick and dirty operating system that had been thrown together by Tim Patterson, a worker at Seattle Computer Products, as a placeholder until he could sell the proper operating system to his customers. And as even Gates himself admitted, the breakthrough graphical user interface that became the basis for Windows was ripped off from the researchers at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. As Bill would say after Apple unsuccessfully sued Microsoft for copyright infringement over Windows GUI, Hey, Steve, just because you broke into Xerox's house before I did and took the TV, doesn't mean I can't go in later and take the stereo. And, as Gates also admits, it is not a spirit of selfless generosity that motivates his interest in vaccines and other lucrative health interventions. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about your approach to vaccinations. You wrote something recently, and, and like you always do, you kind of looked at the problem from a scientific and business perspective on things. You've invested $10 billion in vaccinations over the last two decades, and you figured out the return on investment for that, and it kind of stunned me. Can you walk us through the math? You know, we see a, a phenomenal track record. It's been $100 billion overall that the world's put in. 
Our foundation uh, is a bit more than 10 billion, uh, but we feel there's been over a 20 to one return. So if you just look at the economic benefits, uh, that's a pretty strong number compared to anything else. As we have seen, Gates's philanthropic investment scheme has paid off well, with his $50 billion net worth having ballooned to over $100 billion after his decade of altruism in the vaccine market. As critics of his foundation have repeatedly pointed out, the 9 million people who die every year of hunger would be best served by securing food supplies, running water, and other basic necessities, not costly medical interventions for rare diseases. But there is no return on investment to be made from that kind of charity. No, this is not about charity. It is about control. The population control grid that Gates has been quietly funding into existence for the past decade, a biometric identification system tied to a digital payments infrastructure that will be used to track, catalog, and control every movement, every transaction, and every interaction of every citizen, is just now coming into view. But the real question is, why is he doing this? What drives a man like Bill Gates, a man rich beyond the wildest dreams of avarice, to spend his time and invest his fortune in schemes to control the population? To find the answer to that question, we have to examine Gates' family background. Bill Gates, it should not be surprising to learn, was born into money. His great-grandfather, J.W. Maxwell, was the president of National City Bank in Seattle. His grandfather, Willard, was also a banker, and his grandmother, Adele, a prominent Seattle civic leader. Bill Gates' mother, Mary Maxwell Gates, was a scion of the Maxwell banking family and, by all accounts, as hard-driving as her forebears. She served as a director of several companies, including First Interstate Bank Corp. and KIRO-TV of Seattle. She served as a regent at the University of Washington, and she was appointed to the board of the United Way of America, where, as we have seen, she persuaded IBM CEO John Opel to help her son in his fledgling software development career. Bill's father, William H. Gates Sr., was a prominent Seattle-area lawyer. He co-founded a powerful law and lobbying firm, helped Howard Schultz in his bid to buy Starbucks, served on the boards of numerous companies and organizations, and, along the way, had a profound influence on his son's life and career. My dad was large presence, both physically and in terms of his wisdom. He worked very hard, so he'd leave in the mornings, often before we had breakfast, and get home in time for dinner. You know, I always looked up to my dad in terms of how hard he worked. At the dinner table, my dad would go through various lawsuits and expect us to follow along. He had high expectations. The young Bill Gates technically William H. Gates III, although his card-playing family dubbed him Trey, learned much from his parents. From his mother's banking family, he inherited a nose for the dollar, as one childhood friend's father called it. From his hard-driving, legal-minded father, he learned the value of legalizing business arrangements. As a child, he even had a legal contract drawn up to grant him the use of his older sister's baseball mitt. These traits would not earn him many friends, but they served him well as he began to bring order to the anarchic software development community of the 1970s. At that time, software for the brand new personal computer market was the realm of computer hobbyists, people whose excitement about the microcomputer revolution and love of engineering and problem solving led them to develop and share code freely with each other. But this was no good for the young Bill Gates, who, even before Microsoft was off the ground, was already dreaming of commoditizing this hobby and turning it into the basis of a business empire. In 1976, with the ink still wet on Microsoft's first contract with micro-instrumentation and telemetry systems of Albuquerque, New Mexico, the then 21-year-old Gates wrote an open letter to hobbyists, excoriating the early computer enthusiasts who represented his main market for sharing Microsoft's code for Altair Basic. As the majority of hobbyists must be aware, most of you steal your software. Hardware must be paid for, but software is something to share. Who cares if the people who worked on it get paid? Is this fair? The royalty paid to us, the manual, the tape, and the overhead, make it a break-even operation. One thing you do do is prevent good software from being ridden. Who can afford to do professional work for nothing? What hobbyist can put three man-years into programming, finding all bugs, documenting his product, and distribute for free? 
The fact is, no one besides us has invested a lot of money in hobby software. We have written 6800 BASIC and are writing 8080 APL and 6800 APL, but there is very little incentive to make this software available to hobbyists. Most directly, the thing you do is theft. The letter was awkward and tone-deaf, as many people have described the young Bill Gates in his social interactions. It heaped vitriol on the very people who would be the customers of any future business, and tried to change an established culture of sharing software code merely by decree. Even Apple computers, which would go on to be one of the prime purveyors of walled garden systems that restrict users' ability to control their own computers, scored an easy marketing victory by responding to Gates's angry letter with a reminder that, yes, folks, Apple Basic is free. But the gauntlet was thrown down, and Gates would have his way. Although freeware and other forms of open-source software development still exist, the establishment of software code as legally protected intellectual property has led to the rise of billionaires like Gates. A nose for the dollar, and a knowledge of how to use the legal system to get what you want, were not the only things to emerge from Bill Gates' childhood, however. His parents also encouraged discussion about the family's charity work and the causes they held close to their heart. As Gates revealed to Bill Moyers in 2003, those causes included the population issue, which sparked a lifelong interest in reproductive health. One issue that really grabbed me as, as urgent uh, was, were issues related to population, uh, reproductive health. But did you come to reproductive issues as an intellectual? When I was growing up, my parents were always involved in various uh, uh, volunteer things. My dad was uh, head of Planned Parenthood. And it was very controversial uh, to be involved with that. Gates tips his hand when he equates issues related to population with reproductive health. The topic is particularly controversial because population control and reproductive health have been used for half a century as a euphemism for eugenics, the discredited pseudoscience that holds that certain families are fit to be leaders of society by virtue of their superior genes. As we saw in Why Big Oil Conquered the World, eugenics was a field named and codified by Francis Galton, cousin of Charles Darwin. Ostensibly concerned with heredity and what would later be known as genetics, the eugenicists believed that the rich and powerful were rich and powerful not because of luck or chance or happenstance, and certainly not from the deployment of cutthroat business tactics and underhanded dealings. No, the rich and powerful had attained their status because they came from better stock. Conversely, the poor were poor because of their defective germplasm. As transparent as it seems to us today that this ideology was a self-serving self-justification for the ruling class, it was quickly taken up as the great social crusade of the early 20th century. From Teddy Roosevelt, to H.G. Wells, to Julian Huxley, to Winston Churchill, there was widespread support for the eugenicist notion that society must strive to make sure that the rich and well-born breed as much as possible, and the poor, infirm, and feeble-minded be prevented from having children. A common eugenicist argument was that the scarce resources of society should not be used to support the lower classes, as that only encouraged more of their kind. Instead, life-saving medical care and intervention should be rationed so that those resources can be best put to use elsewhere. So-called negative eugenicists even took things further, with some, like famed playwright George Bernard Shaw, calling for people to be called before a state-appointed board to justify their existence or be put to death. But there are an extraordinary number of people whom I want to kill. Not in any unkind or personal spirit, but it must be evident to all of you, you must all know half a dozen people at least, who are no use in this world, who are more trouble than they are worth. And uh, I think it would be a good thing to... Uh, make everybody come before a properly appointed board, just as he might come before the income tax commissioners, and say every five years or every seven years, just put him there and say, sir or madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? But in the post-World War II era, as the name of eugenics became tarred by association with the Nazi atrocities, the talk of death panels and other harsh eugenicist notions was dropped from public conversation. Now, the quest to reduce the size of the poor population 
was spoken of as population control and reproductive health. Still, occasionally, these old negative eugenics ideas are revisited in moments of candor. You're raising tuitions at the University of California at the, as rapidly as they can, and so the access that used to be available to the middle class or whatever is just rapidly going away. That's a trade-off society is making because of very, very high medical costs and a lack of willingness to say, you know, is spending a million dollars on that last three months of life for that patient, would it be better not to lay off the, those 10 teachers and to make that trade-off in medical costs? But that's called the death panel, uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. It is worth questioning why this man, who openly muses about death panels and the trade-offs of providing health care to the elderly, is to be taken completely at face value in his attempts to slow population growth in the third world, or to handle a coronavirus health crisis that primarily affects the elderly. That the Gates agenda is being driven by a eugenicist ideology is suggested by multiple lines of evidence, both historical and current. As we have also seen in Why Big Oil Conquered the World, the Rockefeller family was instrumental in funding and promoting eugenics, both in America and overseas. The Rockefellers helped fund the Eugenics Record Office. The founding director of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, William Welch, sat on the ERO's board and helped direct its activities. The Rockefellers sponsored the studies of the eugenics researchers at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes in Germany, including Ernst Rudin, who would go on to draft Nazi Germany's forced sterilization law. And, when the American Eugenics Society became embarrassed of its own name, its longtime director, Frederick Osborne, merely took over as president of the Rockefeller-founded Population Council. This dedication to the cause of public health did not escape the approving gaze of Bill Gates Sr. In a chapter of his 2009 book, Showing Up for Life, called Walking with Giants, he writes admiringly of the Rockefellers and their influence in the field. Every corner we've turned in the field of global health, we've found that the Rockefellers were already there and had been there for years. When we committed to childhood immunization, we found ourselves building on efforts the Rockefeller Foundation had helped launch and fund in the 1980s. When we became interested in fighting malaria and tuberculosis, we learned that the Rockefellers had been studying the prevention and treatment of such diseases around the globe for in some cases, as long as a hundred years. A similar dynamic held true in the case of HIV-AIDS. A lesson we learned from studying and working with the Rockefellers is that to succeed in pursuing audacious goals, you need like-minded partners with whom to collaborate. And we learned that such goals are not prizes claimed by the short-winded. The Rockefellers stay with tough problems for generations. As Gates Sr. suggests, it is by working with like-minded partners, that such great achievements in the field of global health can be made. For the Gates, these like-minded partners include the Rockefellers themselves. Bill Gates Sr. got to discuss global health, agriculture, and environment with the likes of David Rockefeller Sr. and David Rockefeller Jr. at a meeting on Philanthropy in a Global Century at Rockefeller University campus in 2000. And Bill Gates, as we have seen, co-hosted a meeting on reducing the population with David Rockefeller in 2009. But the most salacious hints of a deeper agenda are not to be found in the Gates's public associations, but in the associations that they have tried to hide from the public. Jeffrey Epstein may be dead, but this story isn't. A shocking new report from The New York Times sheds light on the connection between Microsoft founder Bill Gates and the late Jeffrey Epstein. After Gates' name came up in connection with Epstein and MIT Media Lab, Gates gave a statement to The Wall Street Journal where he insisted he did not have any business relationship or friendship with Epstein. But new reporting from The New York Times outlines numerous meetings between Gates and Epstein and a conversation with Bill and Melinda Gates' foundation, a connection between their foundation and J.P. Morgan to set up a charitable fund that would financially benefit Epstein. You know what I want to know? Why? Beginning in August of last year, a string of information connecting Bill Gates to convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein began to emerge. Flight logs revealed that Gates had flown on Jeffrey Epstein's private jet. An email surfaced showing disgraced MIT Media Lab director Joy Ito, 
who resigned from his position after it was discovered that he had helped cover up Jeffrey Epstein's identity as an anonymous donor to the lab, informing his staff that a $2 million donation to the lab in 2014 was a gift from Bill Gates, directed by Jeffrey Epstein. As the story gained momentum, Gates tried to downplay the relationship, with a Gates spokesperson protesting that Gates didn't know it was Epstein's plane, and Gates himself insisting that, I didn't have any business relationship or friendship with Epstein. This was immediately contradicted by the New York Times, who reported in October of 2012 that Gates had in fact met with Epstein on multiple occasions, even going so far as to discuss the creation of a multi-billion dollar charitable fund with seed money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and J.P. Morgan Chase. According to the Times, Gates emailed his colleagues about Epstein in 2011. His lifestyle is very different and kind of intriguing, although it would not work for me. Epstein's will even named Boris Nikolich, a Harvard-trained immunologist who served as the chief scientific advisor to both Microsoft and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and who appears in the sole publicly known photo of Epstein and Gates' 2011 meeting at Epstein's Manhattan mansion, as the backup executor of Epstein's estate. It is not difficult to see why Gates would try to distance himself from his relationship with a child sex trafficker. Epstein, after all, is suspected of ensnaring high-ranking politicians, businessmen, and even royalty in an intelligence-directed honeypot operation, recording them in the act of sexually abusing underage girls and using that evidence as blackmail. But, as it turns out, the attempt to suppress the Gates-Epstein story may have been an attempt to suppress the revelation of an altogether different shared interest. Sources say several accusers have come forward in New Mexico, where Epstein owns a sprawling ranch. According to a new report published in the New York Times, not verified by NBC News, Epstein wanted to use the ranch for controlled breeding, using his DNA to improve humanity. Citing two award-winning scientists and an advisor to large companies and wealthy individuals, the article reports Epstein surrounded himself with leading scientists and would tell them he wanted to have 20 women impregnated at a time on the ranch. The already scarcely believable Jeffrey Epstein story took another bizarre turn in August of 2019, when it was reported that Epstein hoped to seed the human race with his DNA. As the New York Times explained, Epstein's plan to impregnate 20 women at a time at his New Mexico ranch in order to seed the human race with his DNA, a plan he told to a number of the scientific luminaries he kept in his orbit, put a modern gloss on a very old idea. Mr. Epstein's vision reflected his long-standing fascination with what has become known as transhumanism, the science of improving the human population through technologies like genetic engineering and artificial intelligence. Critics have likened transhumanism to a modern-day version of eugenics, the discredited field of improving the human race through controlled breeding. Epstein's interest in genetics led him to sponsor a number of scientists working in the field, including George Church, a Harvard geneticist whose lab received funding from Epstein's foundation from 2005 to 2007 for cutting-edge science. Church publicly apologized for his connection to Epstein, which included several meetings a year from 2014 onward. This was neither the first nor the last time that this unassuming Harvard biologist, whose cutting-edge science often strays into controversial areas, caused a public scandal. In 2019, Church proposed a genetics dating app, which was immediately denounced as applied eugenics. Church also acted as scientific advisor to Editas Medicine, a startup seeking to use the genome editing tool CRISPR-Cas9 to eliminate diseases by deleting the parts of a genetic code responsible for the illness. In 2015, the company announced it had raised $120 million from a group led by Epstein's appointed backup executor, Dr. Boris Nikolich. Naturally, that group of investors included Bill Gates. Yes, Bill Gates is certainly following his father's advice to collaborate with like-minded partners. So the question remains, is Bill Gates motivated by eugenics? Given that eugenics went underground over half a century ago, we are unlikely ever to unearth a frank admission along those lines from Gates himself. After all, there are no longer any card-carrying members of the American Eugenics Society. The society was rebranded in the 1970s when, as the society's founder noted, 
it became evident that changes of a eugenic nature would be made for reasons other than eugenics, and that tying a eugenic label on them would more often hinder than help their adoption. But there was an American eugenic society in the 1920s, and it just so happened to boast a William H. Gates on its member roster. But perhaps that is just a coincidence. And there was an American eugenic society in the 1960s, when William H. Gates II was preceded as head of Planned Parenthood by Alan Guttmacher, who simultaneously served as the director of the American Eugenics Society. And perhaps it was coincidence that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation organized their London Summit on Family Planning, at which the Gates recommitted themselves to funding population control in the Third World, in July 2012, on the anniversary of the first International Eugenics Congress, held in London exactly 100 years prior. And perhaps it is reaching to compare the young Bill Gates's dating preferences to the genetic-based dating favored by modern-day eugenicists. I interviewed several women who had dated Bill just briefly, and one told me the very, que very first question Bill asked her was, what did you score on your SAT test? You know, this is not exactly, you know, what a, what a, what a young woman wants to hear. Um, for Bill Gates, though, he had scored a perfect 800 on his, on his math portion of the SAT, and, and this was a matter of pride with him, and he wanted to make sure whoever he was dating, you know, had scored a pretty high, pretty high grade. No. We cannot expect an answer about Bill Gates' true motives to come from Gates himself. By this point, the question of Bill Gates' intentions has been buried under the combined weight of hundreds of millions of dollars of paid PR spin. Like the Rockefellers before them, the Gates have long since learned the secret of enlarging their family fortune, not to mention their control over the human population, by donning the mask of philanthropy. There are many perspectives on Bill Gates. Depending on who you ask, he is a computer savant, a genius businessman, or a saintly philanthropist. But all of these perspectives have been brought to you through PR outlets founded or funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Bill Gates is no longer a subject for historians, but hagiographers. Now we must confront the question of why this man is motivated to build such a web of control. Control over our public health agencies. And for all 193 member states, you must make vaccines a high priority in your health systems to ensure that all your children have access to existing vaccines now and to the new vaccines that have recently become available. Control over our identities. And the lack of an ID system is a problem not just for the payment system, but also for voting and health and education and taxation. And so it's a wonderful thing to go in and create a broad identification system. Control over our transactions. Once financial flows go underground, uh, where you have lots of legitimate transactions mixed in with the ones you want to track, and once they're going over a digital system that the U.S. has no connection to, it's far more difficult uh, to find the transactions that, that you want to be aware of or that you want to block and even control over our bodies. But we're going to have this intermediate period of opening up, uh, and it won't be normal until we get a, an amazing vaccine uh, to the entire world. We must confront the possibility that this quest for control comes not from a selfless spirit of generosity that never seemed to exist before he became a multi-billionaire, but from the same drive for money the same desire for domination, and the same sense of superiority that motivated him on his way up the corporate ladder. But if the answer to the question, who is Bill Gates, is Bill Gates is a eugenicist, that tells us some important things about the world that we are living in. It tells us that Gates is deceiving the public into supporting his takeover of the world with a false front of philanthropy. It tells us that the goal of the Gates like the goal of the Rockefellers before them, is not to improve the world for humankind, but to improve the world for their kind. And most importantly, it tells us that Bill Gates is no comic book supervillain, single-handedly directing all of the chaos that is unfolding in the world or single-handedly bringing his own order to that chaos. No, if Bill Gates is a eugenicist, driven by a belief in the superiority of himself and his fellow wealthy elitists, then what we are facing is not one man, 
or even one family, but an ideology. This is not a trivial point. One man, whatever his wealth, can be stopped easily enough. But even if Bill Gates were to be thrown in jail tomorrow, the agenda that has already been set in motion would continue without missing a beat. An entire infrastructure of researchers, labs, corporations, governmental agencies, and public health bodies exists, funded more often than not by Gates, but driven by the belief of all those millions of people working for these various entities that they are truly working in the best interest of the people. No, an ideology cannot be stopped by stopping one man. It can only be stopped when enough people learn the truth about this agenda and the world of total, pervasive control that is coming into view. If you have watched all four parts of this exploration on Bill Gates, then you are now one of the most informed people on the planet about the true nature of this agenda. You have seen how the takeover of public health has been used to railroad the world into a headlong rush toward mandatory vaccinations, biometric identification, and digital payments. You have seen how the pieces of this puzzle fit together, and how they represent a far greater threat to the future of humanity than any virus. Here is the good news. Armed with this information, you have the antidote to the scourge of this eugenicist ideology. The truth is that ideologies are viruses of the mind. They spread from person to person, infecting them with ideas that can lead to a disease of the body politic. But here is the even greater truth. Inoculations do work. Inoculations of truth against the lies of those spreading their poisonous ideology. If you have made it this far, it is incumbent on you to help inoculate those around you against the corrupt ideology of Bill Gates and all those who seek to control the population of the world. You must help to spread this information so that others have a chance to see the bigger picture and decide for themselves whether they are willing to roll up their sleeves and accept what is coming or not. But time is not on our side. Even as we speak, mass vaccination campaigns are being prepared. We are already building our plans to vaccinate the whole city of Chicago and working with others across the region on a major plan for this. We've bought syringes. We've bought cold boxes. We've planned out locations. Biometric identification schemes and immunity passports are already being rolled out. And so while we started with travel at our core, we're a biometric secure identity platform where it's always been about attaching your identity to your boarding pass, the airport, or your ticket to get into a sports stadium or your credit card to buy a beer. And so now with the launch of Clear Health Pass, it's about attaching your identity to your COVID-related health insights for employers, for employees, for customers. Programs for tracking, tracing, and surveilling the entire population are already being beta tested. Today we are launching another useful tool that can supplement the critical detective work we are conducting in public health. Alberta Trace Together is a voluntary, secure, mobile contact tracing application to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. And the digital payment infrastructure the system of financial exclusion that will allow governments to turn off our access to the economy at will is being put into place. In order to avoid the risk of transmission through physical handling of money, we encourage the use of cashless transactions such as mobile money, M-Pesa and otherwise, and credit cards People are using touchless payment systems much more than they're using cash, both because we're not interacting with people directly as much anymore, and also because cash is kind of skeezy. We must spread the word about the dark nature of this population control agenda to as many people as we can, before our ability to speak out against this agenda is taken away for good. Thanks to the likes of Bill Gates, the virus of this population control agenda is already here. It is threatening to crash the system as we've known it. But if Bill Gates has taught us anything, applications like Word and Excel, it's how to deal with a virus. It's time for a hard reset. <laughs>